I got it actually. Great, so welcome everyone to our 2021 voter registration and voting rights training. Um, my name is Selena Salongo. I'm the advocacy coordinator with the Seattle King County Coalition on Homelessness and I will um, ask Allison to introduce herself. Hello everyone, I'm Allison Isinger. I'm the director of the Seattle King County Coalition on Homelessness. I use she, her pronouns and really delighted to have you all here. I'm um, admitting people as they show up and supporting Selena. So I will um, just be talking with you a little bit later on and very, very happy to have the wonderful mix of folks who are here. Thanks. Great. Well, I just want to um, start by telling you the goals of this training. So um, we'll start with giving you a little bit of background about the coalition and how we got um, started with voting rights work. Um, we'll also discuss what it means to be nonpartisan in voter registration work um, and some resources for you um, to guide you through what to say and what not to say to make sure that the work you're doing is strictly nonpartisan. Um, we'll also talk about the dates and deadlines for both the upcoming August 3rd primary election and November 2nd um, general election. Um, and so that kind of informs when you do what work um, and how to frame it um, for the folks that you serve. We'll also talk about who is eligible to vote in Washington. Um, and we'll also talk about changes to um, voting rights eligibility beginning um, next year, 2022. Um, and we'll also kind of walk through an annotated voter registration form and talk about um, the kind of things that often come up when registering people who maybe don't have a residential address, people who have been impacted by the criminal legal system, um, and um, how to fill it out and what the um, ways to do so are. Um, and then we'll also talk about um, registering people to vote is, of course, absolutely important. We also want to make sure that people are getting their ballots um, and voting and turning in their ballots um, by the proper deadline. So um, we'll also talk about um, how you can help people with that next step as well. And I did mention this at the beginning of the recording, um, or before I began recording, but um, for people that did not hear this when, when they joined, we're recording this portion of the meeting um, and uh, through that, throughout this content portion, um, we just ask that you put your questions in the chat and Allison will read it out um, and we can address them via chat. And then once we stop recording, we'll have more discussion um, just to make sure that people who maybe aren't comfortable being recorded can participate fully without worrying about showing up um, on a site um, if they're not comfortable with that. So um, just it, throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, absolutely please put them in the chat and we will make sure to address them. So we'll just kind of get started uh, with some quick background on us. Um, again, my name is Selena Salongo. My pronouns are she, her, and they, them. I'm the advocacy coordinator with the Coalition on Homelessness. Um, and um, we're a nonprofit 501c3 organization. I'll kind of explain how that comes into play in terms of the voter registration work that we do um, in a bit. Um, our mission is to mobilize our community to challenge systemic causes of homelessness and advocate for housing justice. Um, and I'll let Allison um, introduce herself once again and um, talk about how the voter registration work that we do fits into some of the other, um, our mission and vision and um, the other work that we do. Thanks, Selena. Uh, some of you are familiar with the coalition and some of you might be newer to our work. So I will just briefly add uh, to what Selena said that um, in addition to the mission, which you can see up there, we envision a region that acts on a shared sense of responsibility to ensure everyone has a home. When we developed the mission and vision and values statements of equity, justice, and collective action. We were recognizing the fact that the coalition uh, as an organization is made up of up to 60 different organizations that are doing the everyday, every night work of providing services, shelter, housing to people who are or were homeless. 
um, and our membership also includes people who have personally experienced homelessness um, or are homeless themselves, as well as people who work in local government, local congregations, community organizations, such as the ones some of you are part of. And we deeply and seriously believe that homelessness is a crisis that is the result of specific policy choices and can be solved through making different, better policy choices and implementing them well. And the people who care about this issue absolutely have to build coordinated and effective strategies for making these um, visions a reality. Voting is core to our democracy. There are ways that people who aren't eligible to vote can and should be involved in uh, the, the civic life of our communities. But what we have um, found over the years within the coalition is that when we talk about voting and people's voices and people's rights, um, we are making space for people to say what they think is important, to ask the questions that they want to ask. And we're offering the opportunity for those of us who have not personally experienced homelessness to understand in one particular way some of the complexities of not having a home address, of having difficulty accessing things that are online, um, of having to scramble to replace ID that gets lost or stolen or swept. Um, so some of the details that we'll be going into here might make you think as they do make me think, why is this so complicated? And um, those are good questions to ask as well. We are incredibly fortunate in Washington and in King County to have a counterweight to some of the voter suppression efforts that are underway in other parts of our country, but we haven't gotten everything figured out. And while voting by mail is an extraordinary and powerful and effective tool, we know that it's also dependent on having access to the mails. <laughs> so um, having phone access, computer access, the ability to print something out, the ability to get mail on a reliable basis, these all affect whether or not people can vote. And then of course, there is our criminal legal system, which people experiencing homelessness, especially those who are black, indigenous, or other people of color are overwhelmingly overrepresented in. Um, and the effect of that on people's ability to be eligible to vote or what they think is true about their eligibility to vote is profound. So we've lots of information to share with you. We don't expect you to master all of it, but what, what Selena is going to go through includes some of the core information that we're asking volunteers who work with and through the coalition to understand and the staff at our member organizations to understand, to customize and to do effective work on the ground in your respective program or agency or community. I know we have a range here of people who work at organizations that provide homeless services and housing and people who are in community groups. That's a great combo. Um, we hope to be able to have time to uh, have you share your ideas, experiences, and ask questions based on um, what we're sharing here, but also what you've done uh, in, in the past yourselves. And I will just note that when we started doing this work at the coalition on a volunteer, uh, very small scale basis, we did it. Um, and even people within the coalition weren't exactly sure why the coalition was looking at voting rights. And the answer then is still the answer now, which is if, if we are going to make real the vision of ensuring that this is a region where everyone has a home, we have to make sure that the people who don't have homes get to participate in and shape public policy and who is holding elected office at every stage of the process. And we also want to ensure that our democracy is healthy and ensuring that everyone who's eligible can and does engage is a long game and we're in it for the long haul and there have been some thrilling changes that you'll hear about to the law already as well as coming up and our goal is to make sure that that word gets spread far and wide and people can make their own choices and um, and engage in more fruitful long-term planning um, that is what we need 
for actual housing justice to be real. So with that, I'll turn it back to Salima. Thank you, Alison. Um, great, so um, I did mention in a previous slide that we are a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, this means that a lot of the voter registration work that or all of the voter registration work that we do is nonpartisan. Um, I also wanted to mention this um, as well, because many of you may be um, working at a member organization that is also a nonprofit, um, just to say you can do voter registration work so long as it is strictly nonpartisan. Um, so Allison will drop a um, PDF in the chat of the of the Zoom um, that is a really helpful handout on what you can and can't do and how to stay nonpartisan when you're helping people register to vote. Um, I do have some just easy bullet points to share. Um, so nonpartisan work means that you can't wear pins or buttons endorsing certain candidates while you're helping people register to vote. Um, you can't tell people who to vote for. Um, you can't really nod or gesture about candidates or tell people that you like a particular candidate. Um, what we're trying to do is make sure that um, people are able to make an informed decision about who they want to vote for. Um, and so um, that means that you can register people to vote, you can help people to vote, and you can help people navigate elections information and orient them to where they can find resources to make informed decisions about who they want to vote for. Um, and I think the other thing is you can be politically active in your own time, so long as um, you know you're acting um, like, for example, if you want to volunteer for a candidate platform, you can do that. Just make sure that you're not doing it on the time that you're volunteering with the coalition or volunteering with an organization that does need to do nonpartisan voter registration work. Um, please put any questions about this into the chat box. I think the biggest takeaways from this are really um, many organizations believe that they cannot do voter registration work, um, and many organizations actually can as long as it is nonpartisan. Um, and there are a number of resources to, um, to kind of understand um, what you can and can't do um, that are very easy to understand and navigate. Um, but really, this work is just making sure that um, people know what their rights are, um, and have the information that they need um, to feel like they can um, make a right decision when they're voting. Um, Allison, has any have any questions popped up in the chat? Yeah, just now. We awesome. have a question from Karina. Um, if I help a guest register, am I then restricted from talking about my candidate preferences with that guest at any other time? And I think I might uh, just take a, a moment here and, and note that, um, Karina, I think in this case, I'll, I'll take your question to mean that you're <clears throat> acting in the capacity of a staff person, whether um, uh, paid or not, you have a relationship to the people who are at the program where you, where you work um, that is that of a staff person. And I think it is, pretty important to maintain that neutrality and nonpartisanship given that relationship, given the nature of your position and your role with respect to that person. Um, I hope that that's a useful answer and happy to, um, maybe this is something to hold on to for later on, or you can put a follow-up comment in the chat. And the, the issue, of course, as I'm sure um, Karina and others can understand, is we want to avoid any even appearance of attempting to influence people rather than them making their own choices. So helping people um, uh, access information about candidates is valuable and useful. And there is a difference, though, between having a conversation with somebody you don't have any um, power dynamic relationship with and having a conversation with someone um, who is a guest at your program. I hope that's useful. Let me know if, if you wanna go into it more, Karina. Uh, I will also add that organizations, while um, many organizations can't endorse candidates for public office, many organizations can endorse um, 
things like ballot initiatives. Um, and so this is something um, that sometimes may come up um, is you can help people register to vote. And um, if the organization that you're working for um, does endorse a certain initiative, you can say that the organization endorses that initiative. However, I think um, just err on the side of caution and give them the information they need again to make an informed decision, but don't try and um, coerce somebody into voting a certain way specifically or just because your organization is endor endorsing a certain initiative. Um, I also want to give Allison the microphone for that as well, because I know Allison is much more of an expert on what you can and can't say um, to for endorsed um, initiatives. Uh, thanks, Selena. Honestly, the only thing I'll add is um, that nonprofit organizations are are able to take a position pro or con on a ballot measure or an initiative or a charter amendment proposal. Um, it is absolutely uh, legitimate to provide information to people and to say our organization is supporting or opposing because, and here's information so you can make your own decision. Um, that's different from saying we think you should vote this way on this thing in your ballot. Okay, that's all. And the bolderadvocacy.org is a great resource on that as well. And of course, for coalition member organizations, we're happy to continue to serve as a resource. Yeah, and just as the last thing, like framing all of this work is we want to make sure that people's voices are heard. And obviously, that sometimes means that people will have opinions that differ from yours. Um, if people are asking you or saying, like, oh, I want to vote for this candidate that you may disagree with, you can you still have to help them register to vote and vote. So um, that is just something to keep in mind. We want to make sure everyone has their voice heard. Um, and so um, when that happens, I mean, I think a really good response is I'm just here to make sure that you know your rights and that you have the resources that you need um, to feel like um, you can vote in this election. And I'm not here to tell you who or what to vote for. Okay. I will kind of keep going on. Um, and so I think this is something that comes up often in, in conversations. Um, and uh, I think I just want to kind of go into this conversation um, thinking about this idea. Um, and it's, I'm not sure the people I serve will be interested in voting. Um, this is something that many people have said to me. Um, and I think I wanna say that um, many people, um, especially people experiencing homelessness, um, want to vote um, and will do so if barriers are removed. Um, and again, of course, the experience of homelessness can be traumatic and um, many people are in survival mode and maybe voting at that moment is not a priority for them. Um, and of course, um, it's possible that, you know, you're trying to help someone and maybe they're not interested at that time. Um, however, I think um, something to think about is the repetition and the normalizing voting and making sure that everybody's voice is heard is really important and also making sure that the information is out there and the resources are available so that no one is missed. Um, so I think that is our duty um, as people that do voter registration work um, and I hope that you um, feel the same way and presumably you do because you are in this training. Um, I will say um, for the last part of this is um, voter disenfranchisement and social disenfranchisement are very, very heavily intertwined, especially for people that um, experience um, multiple avenues of marginalization um, and voting. Um, so many people who have either lost their voting rights and had them restored and voted um, or voted for the first time. Um, many people report that it makes them feel um, very connected socially, um, and it's a really good way to connect um, to community in a positive way. Um, and so there are more than just um, protecting our democracy, there are also social benefits to making sure that people have their voices heard. Um, and with that in mind, I think um, we kind of had a discussion, but I think for the purposes of recording, I'm going to ask people to put this in the chat. Um, but um, I, I like to think about things in terms of barriers and how can I break them down? Um, and also like what 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 can we do to address the barriers? Um, and so um, for this this training in particular, I think breaking down one of the biggest barriers, which is misinformation about who is eligible to vote um, and who is interested in voting. Um, 
lack of access to resources is a really big thing. Um, we want to make sure that service providers and staff and volunteers at organizations all over have this information and that it's readily available um, so that nobody is left behind. Um, and then culturally appropriate or in language materials, many people report um, you know, an interest in voting, but um, having a really hard time understanding um, if the um, materials aren't in a language that they speak or it's not the language that they prefer. Um, and then I think um, a really big one as well as mistrust with institutions um, is many people are unwilling to engage um, in voting because they've been negatively impacted by multiple different institutions. Um, and I think for this one, it's, you know, reframing voting and saying like, this can be a really empowering thing. This is how you can make sure your voice is heard so that you can change those institutions. Um, and then the last one, um, which is really prevalent is really internalized ideas um, that their voice doesn't matter. Um, this is really, I mean, this is really prevalent among people um, who are unsheltered or people um, that, again, are multiply marginalized. Um, it's really up to us to, who have trusting relationships, to um, encourage them to um, use their lived expertise to help shape um, who is in leadership and what our policies are. Um, Allison, has anything showed up in the chat? No, but I'd love to invite people who have helped uh, do voter registration with the coalition or with their own community group to offer any other barriers that you've observed or that you think you might um, hear about from people if, when you're going out to try to help people register. One thing that has uh, that I mentioned earlier that comes up over and over is um, that people may not have good access to reliable mail service. So we have compiled information about places where people experiencing homelessness can get their mail. Um, there are a number of locations where people can get their mail, but it of course has to be accessible. And certainly in South and East King County, there are fewer opportunities. So I'll also invite you if you know of a good mail service um, that's available to people to share that with us. Um, Susan just said a big one is that people feel that their vote would not make a difference. True for many potential and eligible voters, regardless of their housing status. And um, I don't know, Selena, if you want to comment on that with a particular thought about people experiencing homelessness. Yeah, um, I think this really ties into this, um, both the internalized idea that their voice doesn't matter, um, and also that kind of big mistrust with institutions. Um, there's a, um, the National Coalition for the Homeless has a, like, a huge guide, um, general guide about how to conduct voter registration work. Um, and I, in, on page 11 of that guide, which we'll post later, there is, um, there's a really helpful kind of four step process about how to encourage reluctant voters to, um, to exercise their right to vote. Um, and I think a really big thing is um, starting with affirming what people are saying. Um, so if somebody is saying, I don't feel like my voice matters, what's the point? Um, leaving it there is not, it, that's not ever going to change their mind, but saying, um, you know, something like, you know, I hear where you're coming from. It seems like a lot of the same people get elected in office. Um, but I've also heard of elections that um, were, um, you know, very close um, and just a matter of a handful of votes that um, that changed um, the outcome of the election. Um, and so I'm here to help make sure that, you know, um, everybody's voice is counted so that, um, you know, if, if truly the majority of people believe in this candidate, that that person um, gets elected. Um, so, you know, starting with um, coming in with like an idea of affirming their emotions and not just saying that's not true, um, because that, that is, um, I mean, that is a really big um, feeling that people have and um, it's a very valid feeling. Um, and so starting from a place of affirmation is uh, gonna get you off on a better foot um, and um, have like more positive conversations and interactions. And um, we'll share that resource a little bit later. We don't go into it in depth, but um, it's, I think it's really interesting um, for step. Um, it's, 
four-step guide um, that uh, has really helped me and in my voter registration work. So I will just keep going. Um, and so now that we kind of talked about the importance of this and why we do this work, I just want to talk about who is eligible to vote in Washington. Um, so um, we just really want to underscore this is you don't need a house to vote. Um, you don't need to live in a home to vote. Um, you actually just need to be a U.S. citizen, um, 18 or older on election day. So the primary um, election this year is August 3rd, and then the general election is November 2nd. Um, you um, also 16 and 17 year olds can pre-register to vote. Um, so um, just wanted to note that um, because uh, you you don't have to you can't you can fill out the voter registration form um, before you are 18. However, um, you won't actually get your voter registration card until after you turn 18. So, um, and then the other thing is you need to have lived in Washington for 30 days before the election. So you need to be a Washington state resident. And um, they need to not currently be under Department of Corrections supervision for a Washington state felony conviction. Um, I just want to note that this is the current law as of 2021. Um, it is going to change um, in 2022, which I will um, discuss in, in just a bit. Um, but for this year and for these elections, um, these are the requirements. Um, and you can note that it doesn't, you don't need to live in a home to be able to be a voter. And then, um, as I just, the note at the bottom is if they can't say yes to each of these questions, um, don't proceed with the form. They're not eligible to vote, unfortunately. Um, and we don't want to get anybody in hot water. Allison, is, is there a question that's popped up in the chat at all? Okay, great. Um, and so we just wanted to um, talk about voting rights restoration and particular voting rights restoration for people that were formerly incarcerated or have been convicted of a felony in Washington state. Um, so there's a huge misconception out there that um, if people are convicted of a felony, they lose their right to vote forever. And that is not true in Washington state. And it hasn't been true since about 2009. I think this passed in 2008, um, but went into effect in 2009. Um, so this is something that comes up often is, you know, asking people, are you registered to vote? And um, many people will say, I can't vote, I'm a felon, um, or I can't vote because I've lost my right to vote. And um, letting them know that, well, you know, in many cases, um, people, um, people with previous felony convictions actually can still vote. Um, their voting rights are restored as soon as they're not under the custody or under the authority of Department of Corrections. Um, so, um, this also means that like court fines, restitutions, and legal financial obligations do, don't need to be paid off to have their voting rights restored. Um, they can be um, they can be revoked, um, but that's it's just a really tricky thing, and these laws are changing. Um, but I think the bottom line is. Um, just because somebody has been formerly incarcerated doesn't mean they've lost their right to vote forever. And many people don't actually realize that their voting rights have been restored. Um, and so orienting them to where they can find out whether or not um, their voting rights have been restored um, is something that you can do um, when helping people register to vote. Um, and sometimes it can, uh, I mean, sometimes people aren't really willing to stick around long enough to have that conversation. Um, and so um, I can let you know where you can find like brochures and things to print out to let people know, well, you can read this in your own time and make a decision about whether you'd like to come back and register to vote. Um, ha have any questions showed up in the chat? I don't see any questions, although I'll invite people to um, put something in there while I'm adding one important note. It's, it's extraordinary, but true people who were convicted of felonies in a state other than Washington or convicted of a federal felony never lost their voting rights in Washington state. The Washington state law was written in such a specific way that it only applied to people convicted in Washington state of a felony. And so that's one potentially quick way. I have certainly experienced someone saying to me that they thought that they couldn't register because of a felony conviction, but they were willing to have a little bit of a personal conversation about it. And we quickly determined that that person believed incorrectly that they hadn't got that right. And um, we registered them right then and there. 
The ACLU of Washington also has very useful cards, which we provide to people. But because the law is changing, a lot of organizations aren't reprinting their materials. So um, we just try to keep it fairly simple. And a lot of times, um, just a brief conversation can help clarify things for people. Yeah, and um, so those are the laws as of right now. I do want to forecast for you that the laws are going to be changing next year, um, and it's incredibly exciting. Um, many of you are probably aware, but if you're not, um, this year, the Washington State Legislature passed House Bill um, 1078. Um, so um, this bill was kind of um, led by a community of like currently and formerly incarcerated people um, to change the voting laws in Washington. Um, it was the prime sponsor of the bill this year was Representative Tara Simmons, who is, I believe, the first formerly incarcerated um, legislator in Washington. Washington. Um, so um, she was a really huge asset to um, ensuring that the narrative about, um, you know, having um, a history with the criminal legal system has changed um, and was a really big part in um, making helping this bill to pass. Um, and so I would just recommend looking her up because um, she's such an incredible leader. Um, but uh, so um, what this means is that beginning in 2022, so January 1st of 2022, um, people um, in Washington who are convicted of a felony um, will have their voting rights restored immediately after leaving prison. Um, so um, for people that have already exited prison but are on um, community custody is what it's called, um, they'll actually also have their voting rights restored. Um, and then again, court fines, restitutions, legal financial obligations, they don't need to be paid off to have voting rights restored. Um, and so um, this is really, really exciting. I think it's an estimated 20,000 people um, that will have their voting rights restored in Washington. Um, and it also creates a lot of huge clarifications about like when exactly people get their right to vote restored. Um, under current law, it's really confusing. And that's why a lot of people just don't don't vote even if they're eligible is because they're afraid. Um, and so this time it's it's a very clear line of if they are if they're not currently incarcerated, they have their voting right restored as long as they meet all of the other eligibility criteria. Um, I did have a video. Um, it's about a minute long. Um, so let me just stop the screen share. Okay. So I'm really sorry. Sometimes I can be technologically challenged. <laughs> So, I hope you can all hear this. Well, I um, really like sharing that video because it was made by um, the Washington Voting Justice um, Coalition, which is one of our partners in the Washington Voting Rights Restoration Coalition, um, which is um, this partnership of um, formerly and currently incarcerated leaders um, and allies um, that work to pass this voting rights restoration law. So highly recommend following them. Um, and then I believe Allison has also dropped in the um, website information for the Voting Rights Restoration Coalition. So it's free the vote um, 
wa.org. Um, so highly recommend checking them out as well. Um, but yeah, I, um, I hope that was informative and I'm, um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And I do just wanna add, um, so I think being really clear that um, this law won't go into effect until next year. Um, so um, while it's really exciting, um, a lot of this year, the remainder of this year is being spent telling people, this is what your rights are currently, which is again, um, these current laws, um, but they're changing next year. Um, so being really clear about that distinction, um, just to make sure that nobody gets into hot water for trying to register to vote. Um, any questions at all in the chat, Allison? Okay, great. Um, so now that it, we kind of covered who is eligible to vote in Washington, I just wanna cover the ways to register to vote in Washington. Um, a lot of this information is very accessible on the Washington State Secretary of State website, as well as the King County Elections website, which are really great resources. Um, so I won't try to cover them um, in too much detail. I just kind of want to highlight the things that often come up when registering people experiencing homelessness to vote um, that just often come into play. Um, so there are three ways to register. One is online. Um, and the deadline to register online is eight days before the date of the election. I'll let you know what those specific dates are for the upcoming elections. Um, something that you should note about this is that it does require a valid Washington ID or driver's license. Um, and, and of course it requires computer access. Um, so this sometimes comes into play where um, uh, folks have lost their ID or um, you know it's expired. Um, and so if, if they don't have that, then um, there are some other options for them still. Um, uh, so the other way to register is by mail. So most people are probably familiar with the paper voter registration forms. Um, that's how I've registered to vote for the first time. Um, and that's how I think what many people are um, familiar with. Um, and so um, this one, the deadline similar to the online one is eight days before election date. But something to note is that it must be received by King County elections by that date. Um, so you can't put it in the mail on that date. It needs to be sent um, you know, the week prior to make sure it gets into King County elections office um, so that they have time to mail out the ballot um, to the person who is registered to vote. Um, something to note about this is um, this actually does not require a valid ID or driver's license. Um, people can actually use the last four digits of their social security number. Um, this is really great because many people, you know, if even if they've lost their social security number, social security card or ID or driver's license, they still know the last four digits of their social security number. Um, so um, it's a really, it's a little bit more accessible. Um, and then the other thing about this one to note is that um, it does, uh, you can, the voter registration form actually does require being sent in the mail. So it does require postage. It doesn't have prepaid postage. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind um, as doing this work. Um, and then um, the last way to register is in person. So the King County Elections Office is in Renton. Um, so it opens, um, you know, a couple weeks before Election Day for people to go in and register, but also for people to update their registration as well. Um, and then um, vote centers. Um, so these open up all around King County um, and they open the weekend before the date of the election. So I'll kind of walk through what those vote centers will be, what their hours are um, and the particular dates for these upcoming elections. Um, but before I move on, um, any questions with that so far? Nancy asked whether or not a paper voter registration form can be printed off the website. Yes. Um, yeah. And I can go into that later. Um, but yes, you can print out a paper voter registration form. Um, it doesn't have like a nice, like, if you get one that um, is printed by the Secretary of State office, um, it's got a really nice thing that you can fold and it tells you where to put the stamp. Um, if you're printing it out from the website, it might not have that. Um, so you might need to just put it in an envelope. But yes, you can print off voter registration forms from the Secretary of State website. So um, I'm going to show you all of these dates in a variety of ways. Hopefully one of them resonates with you and isn't confusing, um, but just wanted to forecast 
um, the, the timelines and some dates and deadlines um, for the August 3rd primary and then the November 2nd primary or general election. Um, and so um, a couple weeks before the election, vote, voter pamphlets, so these are mailed by local county elections office and have all of the candidates and the ballot initiatives and information about them. So those will be mailed out um, a couple weeks. So for this primary election, it's July 13th. Um, Ballots are mailed, um, I believe it's 20 days before the election. You don't need to memorize these dates. I'm just kind of letting you know what the general timeline is. Um, so it's 20 days before is when the actual ballots are mailed. And then, um, um, and this is for people that have been registered to vote. Um, and then ballot drop boxes open on um, July 15th. So they're just open all around and it's a way for people to, um, you know, quickly drop their, their ballot to be counted. Um, and then um, I think in terms of deadlines, something to note is that um, people can register up to and on the date of election, um, but um, there are just some, so there's, again, there's those three ways to register to vote, which is online and by mail, so that deadline to register for this primary election is July 26th. Um, and then um, after that period of time, they ha have to either go to the King County Election Center or a vote center to register and get their ballot in person. Um, this is just because that deadline is so much um, so far before the election date, just to make sure that um, they can have enough time to mail out the ballot. Because again, of course, registration is one step, but also getting a ballot and turning in the ballot is the other step. Um, so. Um, so that's why that deadline to register online or by mail is, um, you know, over a week before the actual date of election. Um, if they miss that deadline, there is still an opportunity to register to vote in person. Um, so I think a lot of people see that deadline and they're like, oh, I just can't vote in this election because I waited too long. Um, for, for all the procrastinators out there, you can actually still register to vote in person up to an on election day, which is really incredible. Um, and then, um, just again, no need to memorize these dates. I'm just kind of letting you know, um, just forecasting this for you. Um, for the November 2nd general election, um, so it's a similar timeline of um, three weeks before voter pamphlets are mailed, ballots are mailed 20 days before the election. Um, the deadline is um, eight days before the election if you're registering online or by mail. But again, for procrastinators, that weekend before a bunch of vote centers open um, so that people can still register and vote up to and on election day. Um, and I'm, I'm a visual person, but I also like to give repetition um, just to make sure that, you know, the information is presented in a way that resonates with people. But um, just for like key this table just kind of shows the differences in dates between the August 3rd primary and the November 2nd. Um, and so again, um, that in-person registration um, begins to be possible the weekend before the actual election. Um, and then the deadlines to turn in ballots are, um, they need to be postmarked by 5 p.m. on the date of the election, um, or they need to be dropped um, at a ballot drop box or at a vote center by 8 p.m. on that um, on the date of election. Any questions so far in the chat? Uh, no questions yet. I will offer a couple of thoughts. Every time I hear this, I'm reminded of, oh, and here's a useful thing that we've learned, or here's a thing that I think people might want to know as you're thinking about your own voter registration efforts. One thing that um, we take for granted, perhaps, if you've lived in the state for a while, is that we are almost completely a vote by mail state. Uh, many, many other states because of COVID-19 are now rushing to catch up with that. But again, um, what that means is that your ballot will be mailed to you. So what if your address has changed? Well, of course, for people experiencing homelessness or housing instability, their address may have changed multiple times since the last time they registered to vote. So sometimes if people say, oh yeah, I'm registered, I come back with, that's great. Do you know if you're registered at your current address? 
because what they might need is simply your help to update their address in the system. And so might people who are not experiencing homelessness or housing instability. So that's another good thing to be aware of. It's very easy to do. And in fact, I learned just yesterday from the King County election staff that they will even help via the telephone if someone needs to update their address. So that's a great resource to be aware of. Um, I put in the chat links to the King County elections calendar and to information about the vote centers. Um, and I think the, um, the other thing just went straight out of my head. So if I think of it, I'll pop back in. Yeah, and um, I'll kind of walk through a voter registration form and then I'll also talk about um, as well when people just need to, um, if they say they're already registered, how they can actually update their registration. Um, so I'll review that as well in later slides. Um, and so those vote centers that I was talking about, um, I just want to, um, uh, so if you go to the King County election site right now to their vote center page, it might just say they're currently closed. Um, they tend to publish like 30 days before the date of election. Um, but I did ask, I reached out to King County election staff and I asked, do you know what those locations are and what their hours will be? Um, and she was really helpful and she just sent us all of the confirmed locations and hours. So it's not currently published on their site as far as I'm aware, um, but these are confirmed um, that these will be the sites um, of the vote centers around King County. Um, and so um, we can send this out um, in a follow up email um, so you don't have to memorize it or if you're like me and would pr I would probably be rapidly trying to write all of this down. Don't worry, you don't have to do that. We'll, um, we'll make sure to send follow up materials after this. Um, after this uh, presentation. Um, and then I do just want to note, like, again, the King County Elections Office in Renton, um, their hours are, um, they're open earlier, so people can actually register to vote um, in person at the King County Elections Office in Renton um, earlier. It's considered, um, it's kind of similar to a vote center, except it's just the headquarters. Um, so the hours are a little bit different for that site. Um, but otherwise, um, for this August 3rd primary, um, they're all opening the Saturday before Election Day, um, closed on Sunday, and then open on Monday um, and on Election Day. Great. Um, so just kind of going to walk through filling out a voter registration form. Um, I'm, I know that many of you know how to fill out forms, but I just want to kind of um, highlight some things that often come up um, specifically when registering um, people who don't have a residential address or uh, for whom mailing address might be a little bit tricky. Um, so um, just kind of walking you through some required info. So the first and last name required, um, as well as date of birth. Um, so both residential address and mailing address are required um, to register to vote. Um, so um, for residential address, this can be a little bit tricky if people live in a car or in a shelter um, or outside or in a park. Um, so what I just ask people is, well, your residential address is considered, you know, where, where do you spend most of your time? Um, if that's a park, you can put down the address of a park. Um, if it's an intersection um, or Actually, let's say uh, it's if it's the address of a, a shelter, you can use that. Um, but um, if it's an intersection, which it can be, um, you can um, you can actually put that down. It just needs to be identifiable on a map, and it needs to be as close to a complete address as possible. Um, so. An example that I'm thinking about off the top of my head is um, because I lived in the university district for a while is like 45th uh, Street and 15th Avenue. Um, you could put that down as residential address um, and then um, you would still need to put in city so Seattle um, state Washington and then zip code. Um, so it's not a full residential address, um, but it's it's still where somebody spends most of their time um, and again needs to be identifiable on a map and as close to a full address as possible. Um, and again, that also could be like the location of somebody's vehicle, um, where it is most often um, as well. Um, and then, um, oh, and I think the other thing is um, the residential address does determine their voting district or voting precinct. Um, so um, that's why they ask where they spend most of their time or where they live. 
Um, and then mailing address is, of course, um, in, it's important. Um, it's going to be where people are going to receive their ballot. So um, just ask them, you know, where do you receive mail? Um, so it, it, it doesn't necessarily, they don't need to live there. It could be, um, you know, the address of a friend or um, relative, if that's where they receive mail. It could be a community mail program. Um, you know, however they want to receive their ballot, um, ask them to put that address down. And then um, there's some other things like the um, section two of qualifications. That's just where you're, they're making sure that you meet all of the el eligibility criteria and you do need to fill it out. Um, and then identification again for by mail. So this is a paper vote by mail registration form. Um, so, they can put down a driver's license permit or ID um, if it is current. If they don't, you can use the last four of your social security number. Um, so, and it's an either or, it's not both. Um, and then um, in section five, um, if they have, if they're updating their voter registration, that's really helpful. Um, or if they've moved, that might be really helpful to fill out. Um, but and it doesn't actually have to be complete. So um, that's just um, something to keep in mind. Um, and then the last thing is um, the signature. Just ask them to sign it as they would any other legal document. Um, and this is kind of important because they do kind of match this registration signature with the signature that's on their ballot. Um, so try to be consistent about the way it's signed. Um, and then just walking through some, you know, some other information and why they're asking um, for it. So gender um, it just helps with identification purposes, but it's not required. Um, email and phone, um, highly recommended if they have, um, if those things are accessible to them. Um, it's a really good way for King County Elections to contact them if there are any issues with their form or their, with their ballot. Um, so highly recommend that um, if they are able to provide that. Um, and then again, that change of name address part um, doesn't necessarily have to be complete. It's just for the purposes of updating any voter registration um, information. And then I think um, just some last things, I'm, I know that it's on the side, but just something to keep in mind um, is it does need to be blue or black pen. So if they've got like, um, I, I was drawing earlier with my gold gel pen, can't really fill that out, um, fill out a voter registration form with my gold gel pen, unfortunately. Um, and also a lot of people have pencils and they can't fill it out with a pencil. So just make sure that it's blue or black. Um, and then um, something else to think about is um, if somebody doesn't have their glasses with them, which often happens, you can actually fill it out for them, um, but they do need to sign it. So um, you, can you can help them fill out the form. You can even ask them to say verbally um, and then fill it out, but really just make sure that they're the ones signing it um, because again, they're matching the ballot to um, the, the, uh, the signature on the ballot to the signature on this voter registration form. So they do need to be kind of matching and consistent. Um, and then I think, again, that distinguishing residential address ask people where they most often are. It doesn't necessarily have to be a full address. Um, it determines, uh, you know, their voting precinct and what's gonna show up on their ballot. Um, and then the mailing address is w ask them where, where do you wanna receive your ballot um, and, or where do you want your ballot sent? Um, are there any questions that kind of arise? I know, I know everybody knows how to fill out a form, but these are just things that sometimes come up. Um, so I just wanted to walk you all through that. One of the things that I um, find is that sometimes talking about filling out the form with someone is an opportunity to give them a little bit of information that they may not have. Again, things are constantly changing, but in both Seattle and King County, who represents you depends on where you live because we have district by district representation for city council and county council members. And sometimes explaining that to people so that they understand why there are two addresses asked for, where you spend most of your time and where you get mail, helps them feel more willing to share that information. Um, to be honest, all the work that we do, whether it's voter registration work or advocacy and helping people communicate with their elected officials at the city, county, state, and federal level is a reminder of how much we've um, not got a very 
um, robust understanding of our own civic processes. And so a government of, by, and for the people is really something that we have to work for. <laughs> um, there was a very relevant question that I did answer in the chat, but I'd like to share and um, uh, because it's really important for everyone to recognize, Nancy asked a question about um, turning in voter registration forms for people. So you've helped someone fill out a form and um, you maybe want to save money on postage. Can you collect the forms and turn them in? Um, so I'll let Selena answer that. And then maybe this is an opportunity for me to speak briefly about stamps. Um, I mean, the short answer is yes, um, make sure that you're turning it in um, or putting it in the mail within five days. Um, it's not really good to sit on people's personal information um, and you just want to make sure that you're not losing it um, to make sure that they get their ballot and are able to vote. Um, but yeah, that's generally, yes, you can do that, but please do it within five days. Yes. And also the King County elections folks really are trying, I think, for very good reasons to understand who is out there doing voter registration drives. Um, we're fortunate to be part of the Voter Education Fund, which is a partnership of the Seattle Foundation and King County Elections to actively work with 30 community-based organizations to increase understanding of voting and increase voter registration and participation among historically disenfranchised and currently disenfranchised groups of people. And we're being asked, and I would invite you to think of yourselves as part of this, to fill out a really simple cover sheet to let the folks at King County Elections know that you're turning these in on behalf of two or more people. And I put the link to the form in the chat and this just allows King County elections to sort of have an understanding of who's out there doing this work. Again, in other communities, there is, I think, a suppressive interest in making it harder for community-based organizations to do voter registration drives. That's not what's happening in our community, but they are under extraordinary scrutiny and perhaps appropriately extraordinary scrutiny. And so we wanna do everything we can to give them a clear sense um, that people who are doing voter registration out in the community know what they're doing and are doing it appropriately and accurately and that they can reach out to you if they have any questions or concerns. It's also been a very useful way for us to let King County Elections know, yeah, we work with partners, volunteers, staff at our member organizations. So you may be getting a whole bunch of voter registration forms that do not have traditional residential addresses. And in a way it helps us if they understand, yep, there's somebody from Hopelink, there's somebody from a safe parking program, there are people who are doing this work in Covington or in Burien or in Bellevue. And that's really good because then they will um, give it a little extra attention. And if someone has forgotten something, um, they may even reach out to us or to you to correct. Great, well, um, I just wanted to kind of give again, um, other information that you may need to know. I did say this um, just a couple minutes ago, but again, if you have a voter, a completed voter registration form and you're turning it in on behalf of somebody, please do it um, within five days. It does require a postage stamp. Um, you can also turn it in in person at the King County Elections Office um, in Renton. Um, and then um, updating voter registration. So a lot of people are like, well, I've already registered to vote, um, but you know, asking them if they're registered at the address they're currently at is really important um, because sometimes people haven't updated their registration and they won't receive their ballot. Or if it's been a while since they've voted, um, then it's possible that their voter registration is not active and they need to fill out another form. Um, so there are a couple ways to update a voter registration. Um, so you can do it online. Again, it does require that current Washington ID or license. Um, they can also call King County Elections. Um, so just give them a call. Um, they can email King County Elections as well, um, is something that I learned recently. Um, and um, also by mail, um, you can fill out another voter registration form and fill out the section that says previous information. Um, and it helps them know that you're updating your registration. 
Are there any questions about that at all? Okay. Um, great. And then um, I just wanted to note that um, you can, again, you can print um, voter registration forms online and the Secretary of State website has, um, I'm so sorry, there's a really loud truck right outside my window. Sorry if you heard that. Um, the Secretary of State Office website has voter registration forms in many, many different languages. Um, so that's a really good option if somebody, um, if English is not their preferred or first language, um, you can print it out online. Um, you can also request paper forms by mail um, and you can request forms um, so that there'll be physical forms that can be sent to your agency. Um, and um, you can request them in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, or Chinese. So um, those are the ones they print. And then again, there are more languages available um, online um, to print out um, on the Secretary of State website. And then um, the King County election site is going to be the place that you're going to want to go for things like voters voter pamphlets. Um, so if you do need um, pamphlets printed in other languages, you have to call King County Elections and request them. Um, and Allison, um, I know that you have a lot more information about this, so I'll let you speak about about that. Okay, no, no. Um, yeah, just give them a call um, to and again that that um, number is I don't have that. It's 206-296-8683. If you're seriously going to, um, if you are looking to seriously do voter registration work, I highly recommend just programming that into your phone contacts. Um, they're also extremely helpful, um, both by phone and by email. So um, you can also add them to your email contacts as well. Um, and then I just wanted to highlight that um, on our website, we are we're hoping to shortly post a toolkit for people who want to um, start incorporating this into the services they offer at their organizations. Um, and so it'll include a lot of these things. Um, so that annotated voter registration form, um, that nonpartisan um, PDF document from Boulder Advocacy. Um, we're also working right now on a printable eight eight and a half by 11 um, grayscale poster for organizations that might want to print it. Um, we also may be able to print them in color um, and send them to you. That may be another option. Um, so um, it's just going to be like a very abridged version of here's how to fill out a form. Here's who's eligible. You don't need a home to be a voter. Um, so um, that'll be in that toolkit. And then we also have a small half sheet um, guide, um, paper guide um, uh, that will be available for printing that is just a guide for people that are homeless or unstably housed or impacted by the criminal legal system that just clearly says these are what your rights are, you may be eligible, here's how to fill out that form, um, and here's some uh, additional information. Um, so we're currently working on that, we're getting feedback um, and didn't want to show you a draft version. Um, uh, but um, those are in the works and they'll be uh, posted on our website. And then I mentioned this earlier, but National Coalition for the Homeless has a voter registration, like a guide to just doing voter registration and ideas about how you can um, do other civic engagement activities with the folks that you offer, like candidate forums, those kinds of things, or ballot parties. Um, and so um, that's really helpful. It also has a page about um, how to encourage reluctant voters to exercise their right to vote. Um, so um, super helpful, but um, the information is very general. Um, so um, not necessarily helpful for like if you're looking for specific information about dates and deadlines or um, county information. Um, um, and then I think the final thing that I just wanted to touch on is um, voter registration is one part of this process of voting. We also need to make sure that people get their ballots and actually cast their ballots and vote. Um, so um, I always like if people say if it's getting closer to the date of the election and people are like, oh, you know, I'm already registered to vote. I'm always asking them, did you receive your ballot in the mail? Do you need help filling out your ballot? Do you have any questions? Can I get you any information? Um, and then if they haven't received their ballot by about a couple weeks before the election, um, just ask them to call King County Elections. Um, and then um, to make sure that they get their ballot on time and are able to, you know, 
process the information, vote, and get it in the mail so that it's postmarked and their vote is counted. Um, and then um, the, the other thing that I wanted to note is that people can get replacement ballots um, in person at vote centers. So um, if somebody is like, well, I registered to vote, but my ballot got mailed to um, a friend and we're not on good terms anymore, so I can't get my ballot right now, um, you can just let them know, well, you can get your ballot replaced. Um, you just need to go to a vote center in person. Um, and they're really, really helpful. Um, so. Um, that's just something um, that I might recommend for people that have lost their ballot or don't have access to their ballot or there was an issue with the mail. Um, going to an in-person vote center is gonna be a good option. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think that's about, I think that's all of the information that I had. I think the deadlines to turn in ballots um, just, they again, need to be postmarked by 5 p.m. on the date of the election. Um, so recommend doing it before. Don't put it in the mail that date, but um, if you do have to, make sure that it's going to be postmarked by 5 p.m. Um, and then if they're turning it in in person, they can put it in a ballot drop box, which there are always tons of ballot drop box all around King County. Um, and they can also bring it to a vote center um, on the day of the election. So that deadline is 8 p.m. on the date of the election. And thanks to one of the other remarkable pieces of legislation passed, I believe, last year, um, it's no longer necessary to put a stamp on a ballot. So that's really helpful. Forgive me if I missed your saying that, Selena. Um, I'll also note if people have access to a printer or if you can help folks access a printer, they can also print a replacement ballot um, either at your program site or um, at a at a public library, which of course we are very happy uh, that the Seattle and King County libraries are beginning to open up for services, including computer and printer access. Um, I am uh, just going to put one more thing in here. Selena, this is great. It's just um, 12 after one. So we have a little bit of time for conversation, dialogue, questions burning issues. The last thing I'm going to put in the chat here is our brief survey. If you're planning to do work or you would like to work with us, we'd really appreciate it if you would fill out a brief planning survey to help us um, know what you need in order to do this. Great. Well, I'm going to stop the recording now um, so that folks can feel comfortable discussing freely.